Welcome to a mindfulness workshop presented by the Counseling Center. Learn to know the now. This is part one of a two-part series put on by the Counseling Center. My name is Jennifer Smith, and I am the Collaborative Care Counselor. And my name is Rebecca Gonzalez, and I'm a psychologist at the Counseling Center. My name is Sergio Barrios, and I'm a senior counselor at the Counseling Center. We are excited to have you join us for this Introduction to Mindfulness training. In order to reach diverse audiences and meet the needs of those individuals requiring accommodations, much of the content of this presentation will be read aloud from the slides, and closed captioning will be offered. Although led by Counseling Center mental health professionals, this workshop does not constitute professional therapy or counseling. Participation in this workshop does not mean you become a Counseling Center client. This workshop is designed to be a psychoeducational, encouraging, and experiential opportunity to support the Texas State community. Many of the practices suggested in this workshop have been adapted from practices which have been around for hundreds of years and exact origins of all the mindfulness techniques presented are not known. Every attempt has been made to cite attributions whenever possible. The information and skills presented are generally considered benign or innocuous. In other words, they typically do not cause harm. However, some of the techniques offered may not be best suited for some individuals with traumatic life experiences and or certain mental health conditions. If you have any mental or physical health concerns about information or skills mentioned in this workshop, Please consult with a healthcare professional before trying any suggested techniques. The workshop curriculum and facilitators do their best to bring cultural awareness and sensitivity to the material and ideas presented. Of course, it is not possible to address all identities and intersectionalities in the format of this workshop. If you have questions or concerns related to how this information or the skills mentioned in this presentation may or may not align with your cultural background, and or religious, spiritual beliefs or practices, please seek consultation with a trusted member of your community or religious, spiritual leader known to you. Participation is voluntary. Participants reserve the right to opt out of any experiential exercises. If opting out, please remain quiet and respect others who may be trying to engage in a technique or quietly excuse yourself from the room during the method practice. If you are experiencing any suicidal thoughts or feelings or have a desire to harm yourself or others, please contact the Counseling Center, 512-245-2208. We can also be found on the LBJ 5th floor. Or contact the Hayes County 24-Hour Crisis Hotline at 877-466-0660 for urgent or crisis support. Faculty and staff are encouraged to check Bobcat Balance EAP benefits for details on mental health services and supports available for employees. Scope of this training, the Texas State Counseling Center developed this training for students, faculty, and staff interested in learning mindfulness skills and practice. Mindfulness is a skill that can be beneficial in keeping us in the present moment and in managing intrusive thoughts as we develop a daily practice. This training is aimed to anybody interested in learning the skill, keeping in mind appropriateness based on the benefits that the person can gain in practicing mindfulness versus possible potential harm. The mindfulness training consists of two separate parts. The first part is this on-demand webinar about the basics of mindfulness. We will learn about mindfulness, background, benefits, and limitations. The second part of this mindfulness seminar is in person, a hands-on workshop where Participants will practice different mindfulness exercises that the participant can adapt to their needs. Let's start by going over the objectives of this training. First, we want to understand the history, tenets, and neurobiology of mindfulness, 
understand the benefits, potential risks of mindfulness, and what mindfulness is and what it is not. Recognize the difference between reacting and responding. Learn brief mindfulness skills for beginners, which can help you cultivate present moment awareness. And finally, learn ways to incorporate mindfulness into your daily routine. Let's talk for a moment about the origins and modern practice of mindfulness and meditation. Mindfulness has been a part of both religious and secular practices for thousands of years. Most scholars agree mindfulness is rooted in traditions associated with Hinduism and Buddhism. Some scholars argue there is evidence of mindfulness practices associated with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam perspectives. John Kabat-Zinn was instrumental in bringing mindfulness from the East to the West, integrating it with Western science, and it is attributed with much of how we think of mindful interventions and techniques today. You may have heard of mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. Western modern practices of mindfulness are largely secular, non-religious meditations. Mindfulness practices are commonly referred to as mindfulness meditations. While there are distinct differences between mindfulness and meditation, for the purposes of this presentation, you may hear us use these terms interchangeably. Mindfulness meditations have become popular positive psychology tools and are accepted as successful applications for anyone seeking to improve their overall wellness. Most commonly and widely known practice of mindfulness exists within yoga teachings. Modern mindfulness meditations can be kept simple and done anytime, anywhere, and adapted to fit varying cultural backgrounds and spiritual belief systems. We'd like to take a moment and discuss some of the reported benefits of mindfulness. While this is not an exhaustive list by any means, certainly this is one record of benefits reported from participants that were beginners who practiced mindfulness techniques daily for approximately six to eight weeks. Let's take a look at this list together. And as I read the list aloud, and as you're thinking about each one of these benefits, see if there's anything on the list that you would not be interested in having in your life. Increased ability to focus and concentrate. More positive relationships. Improved personal efficiency and productivity. Improved ability to handle stress. Better able to listen. Better able to think and respond more creatively. Healthier life-work balance. Better able to manage staff. More thoughtful and deliberate decision-making. Improved physical and mental well-being. Greater awareness of social dynamics. Better able to set aside a personal agenda. Improve empathy. Improve memory, particularly in stressful environments. Better able to let go of judgments. Ability to see a broader perspective. Improved emotional stability. Decrease in anger. Increase in positive outlook. Better able to hand difficult emotions. Reduced anxiety, more energetic, and more engaged with work. Typically, there are no individuals who endorse not wanting to have these benefits in their lives. Most of the things on this list, any one of us could see room for improvement in our own lives. We encourage you to learn more about the benefits of daily mindfulness practices in your own life as part of an overall mental wellness and stress management strategy. Moment of silence. I will ask you to please close your eyes and remain silent for two minutes and experience how it's like to remain silent 
without using mindfulness meditation. We have here some questions for you to reflect on. How was it to keep quiet for two minutes? What happened with your thoughts? What sensations were you aware of? What was the most challenging aspect of this exercise? What made it easy for you? We want to offer you a definition of mindfulness by John Kabat-Zinn. He says that mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and without judgment. Also, we believe it's important to define what mindfulness is not. It's not an exercise in positive thinking, blanking your mind or suppressing your thoughts. We want to take a look at the connection between mindfulness and the present moment, the here and the now, and how that engagement and awareness can bring relief to thought loops that often pull us into the past or the future. Researchers have posited that thought loops pulling us into the past are often correlated with symptoms of depression and unpleasant emotions. Our thoughts that jump us forward into the future are often worrisome or fearful, filled with unknowns, uncertainties, and are often associated with symptoms of anxiety. Practicing simple daily mindfulness techniques tend to lead to the now, present moment thinking, which tends to be the healthiest headspace offering an escape from unhelpful thought loops. Now we are going to take a deeper look at how breathing is an essential part of being mindful and supports balance between brain and body connections. Next, we are going to take a look at a short video clip 
reminding us how to keep it simple. Emphasizing breath work as one of the foundations for mindfulness and meditation. This speaker uses the term meditation as an introductory bridge for mindful, non-judgmental thought, acknowledging that breath work can be kept simple. Let's take a look at the video together. We can meditate everywhere, anytime, even three seconds, two seconds, while you're walking, while you're having coffee and tea, while you're having meeting, so you can meditate. Many people have a little bit of misunderstanding about meditation. They think meditation meaning think of nothing, concentrate, <laughs> so push too much. So we cannot block thought and emotion. In fact, we need thought and emotion. So whether you listen to your monkey mind or not, that's an issue. What I call monkey mind, mind is chatting, you know, pala 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 yada yada. So monkey mind is giving your opinion. So whether you listen to opinion or not, it's up to you, right? So through meditation, what we do is, we have to make friends with the monkey mind. But how to make friends? Just giving banana doesn't work, you know? <laughs> so right method is, you need to give job to monkey mind. How to give job monkey mind? So the simple meditation technique is, be aware of the breath. So you ask monkey mind, hello, what's breath? So monkey mind says, ah yeah, good idea. And be aware of breath. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. There's a lot of thought comes at the background. Don't care, no problem. So as long as if you're not forget your breath, anything is okay. No need too much concentration. Just simply be aware of your breath. Breathe in. Uh, in, even two breath, one breath. So therefore, we can meditate everywhere, anytime. Now breathing is something we do automatically. We seldom stop to think about it. But breathing can actually serve as an anchor to the present moment. Focusing on our breath allows us to anchor ourselves to the here and now, as opposed to the past or the future. So today we're going to discuss two different breathing exercises. We hope that you can follow along and engage in these breathing exercises, but remember to listen to your body and do what feels right to you. For each exercise, we will start with a brief description and overview, and then we will transition into practicing the exercise together. Let's start by talking about paced breathing. The goal of paced breathing is to help create a harmonious state between your respiratory system and your heart. This process facilitates a relaxation response. So this breathing technique is designed to focus on the sensations associated with breathing. During the following breathwork exercise, it's very common for your mind to wander. If this happens, as we engage in this exercise, simply acknowledge without judgment that your mind has wandered and reorient your focus on your breathing and counting. An example of this is you can classify your thoughts. So we can think of this is something to deal with later, or this is a school related thought, or this might be a trigger and help ourselves reorient to our breathing and our counting. Let's start with our first paced breathing exercise called the 478 breathing technique. We're going to follow the pattern 478, where we inhale for four counts, hold our breath for seven counts, and exhale for eight counts. You can see this diagram here in our, in our slide. I'll guide you through the exercise. First, get into a comfortable, relaxed position with your feet flat on the floor. If you feel comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. Begin by bringing your attention to the present moment by focusing on your breathing as you breathe normally. Take notice as the breath enters and leaves your body. Now we are going to start our paced breathing. If you find that your mind wanders during the exercise, 
try to redirect your focus to breathing and counting. So I'm going to go ahead and count for you. Go ahead and breathe in through your nose for four counts. One, two, three, four. Now hold your breath for seven counts. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Breathe it out through your mouth for eight counts. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're going to go ahead and repeat this sequence. Let's go ahead and get started. Breathe in through your nose for four counts. Two, three, four. Now hold your breath for seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Breathe out through your mouth for eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now we'll repeat the sequence one last time. Go ahead and breathe in through your nose for four, two, three, four. Now hold your breath for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Breathe out through your mouth for eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Now let's transition to talking about our second breathing exercise called square breathing. Square breathing is also known as box breathing or combat breathing or tactical breathing. Square breathing has been around for many years and practiced among many Eastern cultures. Square breathing became popular in the West by Mark Devine, a former Navy SEAL, who found square breathing was a helpful way for operation teams to maintain calm during times of high stress. The science behind square breathing includes activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for resetting any automatic stress or threat response. Square breathing also engages muscles inside the body responsible for the expansion of your lungs in new ways and stretches those muscles, allowing for fuller, deeper breaths. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through the square breathing exercise. We'll get started. You can breathe in or inhale for four counts. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath. Two, three, four. Breathe out for four, two, three, four. Hold again for a count of one, two, three, four. Let's go ahead and repeat that one more time. So we'll get started by breathing in for one, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Now you can repeat square breathing a couple of times. We'll just do two for today. Now we wanna take a moment to check in with you after completing this first exercise. Here are some questions meant to help you reflect on your experience. So go ahead and take a minute and think about how do you feel after this exercise? What did you notice about your thoughts? What did you notice about your physical sensations? Now that we have learned about mindfulness, let's revisit the moment of silence while being mindful. Please close your eyes and remain silent for two minutes using breathing techniques that you learn to bring your mind to the present moment when, when it starts wandering. We will listen to a piece of music, and in this time, we will be mindful by using our senses, paying attention to the different sounds, the different instruments, and any kind of feelings that evoke in, in you.
Earlier in these presentations, we had you engage with a moment of silence. If you engage with that exercise again, with your new knowledge of mindfulness, what was different? What is different about your thoughts? We want to take a moment and talk a little bit about the neurobiology. We want to share a video from a top neuroscience researcher, contributor, and supporter of daily mindfulness practice. Dr. Dan Siegel uses his hand to give us a model of the brain and introduce us to the important beginnings of our neurobiology, that fight, flight, freeze reactions and thinking as it relates to mindfulness practices and re-engaging parts of our brain and learning how to calm the threat response system. Remember that benefits of mindfulness offer us the opportunity for integration with those brain-body connections and returning the prefrontal cortex to an online status. One of the greatest features of the human brain is the neuroplasticity. In other words, the ability to rewire new neural pathways and create healthy patterns of thinking. Let's listen as Dr. Dan Siegel talks to us about these things. Hello, my name is Dan Siegel, and it's an honor to introduce you to the hand model of the brain. Sometimes the brain in our head is modeled as a plastic model, like the one you see here, that's two times life size. And it's fun to carry a big model around this size because you can take it apart and look at some of the insides and see what's going on. But it's hard to carry this around in everyday life. So what I invented was a model of the brain that you actually have in your hand. My daughter has urged me not to call it a handy model, but it is kind of handy. And the model goes like this. If this brain were oriented in my head in this direction, with this frontal part here behind the forehead, we would create this in our hand model by putting our thumb in the middle, our fingers over the top, and this would be oriented this way. Now, the hand model of the brain is very useful because when you know about the parts of the brain, you can learn how to direct your attention in a way that can get certain areas to not only get activated, but also to start to work together. And you can change both the function and the structure of your brain by knowing about how the brain is structured. So let's walk through these areas of the brain and how they can link together. This hand model of the brain has been useful in classrooms. It's been useful in corporate offices. It's been useful for mediation, for meditation, for people out in the field working with the stresses of working with epidemics, and for people who are just in general trying to improve their lives. So let's go through this hand model and see how it can support your work and your life. If you take your hand and put your thumb in the middle and fold your fingers over the top, this would be the completed model. The top of the brain is called the cortex and would be represented in your fingers. If you lift up the cortex, you'll see beneath it the limbic area, which should have two thumbs to be a perfect model, but most of us just have one. And in this limbic area, you see that there are connections 
upwards to the cortex and even downwards to the area just below it called the brain stem in your palm. And this whole head brain is connected to the body through a number of regions, including the spinal cord represented in your wrist. Now let's quickly review what these areas do and you can see how what you do with your mind can change the way the brain functions. If we lift up the cortex and lift up the limbic area, let's begin with the brain stem. The brain stem is the oldest part of this head brain, and I keep on saying head brain because you have neurons around your heart and around your intestines that people are calling the gut brain and the heart brain. And so I'll use the word just brain, but actually it's a hand model of the head brain. The deepest, oldest part of the head brain is this brain stem. It takes in information from the body and it helps regulate things like how you breathe and how you digest food, how your heart functions. In addition, the brainstem has a very important set of regions that create the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response that comes when we feel threatened. So if you're working in a business, for example, or you're in a classroom or you're at home and you feel threatened by what's going on, the brainstem gets involved to create this reactive state in addition, this brainstem works closely with, if you put your next area down, the thumb region, which is the limbic area. This is a 200 million year old region when we became mammals that works with the 300 million year old reptilian brain. And together they work to create emotion in working with the body. The body, brainstem, limbic area create emotion. The brainstem works with the limbic area to also motivate us to drive our behaviors. And this limbic area appraises the meaning of things, whether things are significant or not, whether they're good or bad. In addition, there are certain ways memory is divided up and connected through the limbic area with an area you may have heard the hippocampus or with its amygdala region. And then on top of that, you have the attachment experience we have as mammals where we connect with caregivers so that they can protect us and we can be sued by them is also mediated by this limbic region not just in childhood but throughout our whole lifespan now these limbic functions work closely if you fold your fingers over with the cortex which is basically making maps so this region makes maps of the outside world with our eyes in the back the occipital cortex Sound comes in the side, the temporal lobe, with the uh, way in which we map out sound. And you even have an area in the front from these second to last knuckles forward called the frontal cortex, also known as the association cortex, where you make associations in thought. And the frontmost part of this frontal lobe here is demarcated by your last knuckles down to your fingernails, and this is called the prefrontal cortex. Now you may have heard a lot about the prefrontal cortex because it's involved basically in something called integration. It integrates cortex, limbic area, you can see it sits on top of it, brainstem, body, and even the social world together. Now when you do a practice, let's say like we have a wheel of awareness practice as a form of mindfulness meditation, or do any kind of mindfulness reflective practice, you are integrating the whole system. When you're not integrated, it can become chaotic and rigid. It's like flipping your lid. So instead of living with harmony within yourself and harmony and connection to others, you're literally becoming chaotic with an outburst or rigid and withdrawn. That's demonstrated by literally lifting up your fingers and showing how this prefrontal region is no longer linking the cortex, limbic area, brainstem, body, and the social world. It's become disintegrated. Now the amazing thing is there's a new set of studies called the connectome studies which show how the areas of the brain that are differentiated can then become connected. So it's connectome. And what research has shown from the Human Connectome Project is the best predictor of your well-being is how interconnected your connectome is. So anything you can do to understand your hand model of the brain and to bring an honoring of differences and a connection of these areas, you'll be promoting integration and you'll be giving yourself the gift that keeps on giving. And the amazing thing too is that integration is likely the source of well-being, 
not just in our bodies, including the head brain, but in our relationships with other people and even with nature around us. Creativity emerges from this integration. Collaboration emerges from integration. So the hand model of the brain reminds us to know the different parts, understand how they may be differentiating themselves if we're angry or getting upset, feeling sad, feeling lonely, making thoughts that emerge, and then opening ourselves to all of these and connecting them together. Whether you do this in the wheel of awareness practice or some other kind of reflective practice, having this brain of yours become more integrated is the pathway toward more well-being in your life, whether it's at work, at home, or in your communities. Integration creates well-being. Thanks for joining me and goodbye. We are not our feelings. Note the difference in the following two statements. I'm a sad person versus I'm a person feeling sad at this moment. Remember, feelings are temporary. Mindfulness allows us to put healthy distance between ourselves and our thoughts and feelings, avoiding over-identification with our feelings and thoughts. Reacting versus responding. We tend to react based on our past experiences. And many of our interactions require to respond. There is a difference between reacting and responding to the situation. Every moment in life is different from each other. For that bas basic reason, every moment in life deserves an appropriate response and not an automatic reaction. Compare how mindfulness techniques allow us the opportunity to choose to respond rather than react. Now we can use our cultural sources of strength in our mindfulness practice. So these are things like meditation in our native language, reading religious texts while engaging in mindfulness practice, reading poetry and other culturally relevant readings, listening to traditional music, body scans, engaging in prayer, or traditional dancing as mindful movement. So as you think about putting your mindfulness practice together, think about what kinds of cultural sources of strength you want to include in your practice as well. So each of us have different cultural and social identities. Some examples include gender identity, racial identity, ethnic identity, sexual identity, religious identity, nationality, ability status, age, language, education, employment status. Now we each experience the world differently based on the identities we hold. And the intersection of our identities impacts our worldview and our lived experiences. In addition to that, Many of us may experience identity-related discrimination, oppression, and prejudice, or we may witness others in our communities be discriminated against or harmed. And we know how mental health is impacted by these experiences. Now, mindfulness can be one way that we can go ahead and self-soothe and engage with more self-compassion if we do experience these things in our lives. Again, it's just one of many things that we may have to do to engage in self-soothing and healing if we experience these things. We want to be clear in our message. There is not a right or wrong way to practice mindfulness. The most important aspect is to practice mindfulness on a daily basis to develop the muscle memory that will allow you to incorporate mindfulness in your everyday life and routines. Think of working out a muscle in your body at the gym. It is not different than that. Consistent repetition and overcoming challenges will develop the skills for a more mindful life. The goal is to make 
your mindfulness practice an automatic response your brain and body know how to do without much effort, just like driving or riding a bicycle. In the part two hands-on experiential workshop, we will present you with various mindfulness exercises and techniques which you can adapt to make your own. That could look like your choice of music or reflective mantra or your own space or time of day that works best for you. We hope you will join us for part two to learn ways you can tailor mindfulness interventions to your unique individualized preferences. So today we've gone over mindfulness and different practices that you can incorporate. Let's talk a little bit about how you can create a daily practice of mindfulness. Daily mindfulness practices may help you create a bit of a sense of balance in your life. And developing mindfulness skills, remember that practice is essential. It will take some time to develop these and to build a habit that you can add to your daily life. The more you engage with these skills, the more benefit you'll see. So when you think about creating your mindfulness practice, you want to keep it simple, start with small attainable goals, and try to do something on a daily basis. One way to practice mindfulness is to use mindfulness meditation to start your day. Set an intention when you wake up in the morning. Do a breathing exercise first thing in the morning. Write an intention to yourself or tell an intention to you, yourself like today I will notice my thoughts and try to engage with more self-compassion and less self-judgment. When it comes to creating your daily mindfulness practice, try to schedule a time to engage in mindfulness. Try to keep the time of day consistent. Pick a time where you know that you won't be interrupted. And you can start with five minutes and then build your way up to 20 to 30 minutes. Doing something like yoga is an amazing mindfulness practice. Mindfulness is actually an essential part of the practice of yoga. You can also take a breathing break throughout your day. So a couple of times a day, you can take a minute just to engage in breathing, some of the exercises we talked about today maybe. Or you can even use a breathing app that's available on most cell phone providers so that you can actually set a reminder and set a timer to remind yourself to engage in mindfulness practice. So what you wanna do is really be kind to yourself and give yourself grace as you build a new habit, keeping in mind that it will take you time to create this habit and have it be something you do in your daily life. What are some things that you feel like you can commit to that we've talked about today? So we talked about different practices. We talked about different kind of ideas associated with mindfulness. What are some things that you feel like you can commit to trying to incorporate into your daily routine? Let's put together all the information that you have learned in today's presentation about meditation and mindfulness. Let's listen to a neuroscience researcher and meditation expert share with us again how meditation can impact the brain in positive ways. Brain activity during meditation looks very different depending on how long you've been practicing meditation. I'm Dr. Yuande Pierce, a neuroscience researcher who studies the many different functions of the brain. You may have found yourself saying, I know this makes me feel great, but why do I have to do it every day? Today, we're going to take a look at all the positive benefits of regular meditation practice can have on your brain. You may have heard that meditation can improve your mood, increase your ability to focus and lower levels of stress. But have you ever wondered why? We can actually shape our brains throughout our lives through a process called neuroplasticity, which is the nervous system's ability to restructure itself in response to internal and external input. It's not the number of brain cells that are important for a healthy brain to function, but the number of connections between them that benefits us most. 
Although it may seem like we're asking our entire bodies to be still, our brains are quite active when we're meditating. Any kind of brain activity promotes neuroplasticity, but there is such a thing as a bad connection. Rumination or getting stuck with one negative way of thinking can strengthen our emotion tied to stress and anxiety. When we meditate, we focus on strengthening the neural connections we want and weakening others. Because we can't exactly just take a peek into a healthy living brain, it's hard to directly study how meditation affects these connections. When comparing the brain activity of both novice and expert meditator, you'll see that the beginner meditators have a lot more brain activity while meditating. Which makes sense, because when you're learning something new, you're still working to overcome the habitual ways thoughts flow through your mind. But when we become more experienced meditators and become better at achieving a meditative brain state, our brain activity is mostly in three main areas. The first is the chordate, which is thought to have a role in allowing us to note and let go from thoughts or information we don't want to engage while meditating. Second is the entorhinal cortex, which is thought to control our thoughts and also prevent mind wandering. And last but not least is the medial prefrontal cortex, which is thought to support the enhanced self-awareness we feel while meditating. Meditation has shown to increase gray matter in the brain in a few key areas, meaning it's a great way to combat the natural decline of gray matter in the brain that happens as we age. The biggest changes are seen in the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for complex thinking processes like concentrating on a task or making difficult decisions. It also plays a big role in our ability to resist distractions. So as it becomes bigger, we can more selectively focus and sustain our attention more easily. Meditation has also been shown to shrink the amygdala, which is also known as the fear center of the brain. The amygdala activates our physical and emotional responses to perceived danger commonly known as the fight or flight response. Having a smaller amygdala reduces the capacity of our body to respond this way to the small stresses in life. In turn, this decreases our overall levels of anxiety, stress, and fear. After a meditation, you feel great, but these good feelings can wear off, like a drug that stops working over time. In order to really strengthen these changes, consistency in your practice is key. It may be helpful to think about meditation as doing exercise for your brain. So even if you're struggling to fully enter a meditative state at the beginning, you can take solace in knowing that you're gaining long-term benefits for your brain. I'm Dr. Yuande Pierce. Thank you very much for watching. Finally, if you've enjoyed learning about our mindfulness practices today, please join us for part two of our training. Part two is actually designed to be more experiential. Today, we talked a little bit about the history, the tenets, the background of mindfulness, and gave you a brief introduction into mindfulness practice. But part two will actually be more experiential in nature. We'll talk more about the notion of self-compassion. We'll give you even more strategies for mindfulness, mindfulness practice, including more breathing exercises, um, things like mindful eating exercises or body scan exercises, mindful movement exercises. And if you're interested in learning more about these things, please join us for part two of our presentation that will be available shortly. If you are interested in learning more about mindfulness, we encourage you to access therapy assistance online. This is a mental wellness app that is available for all staff, faculty, and students at Texas State University. You can access the information for signing up for therapy assistance online through the Counseling Center website. We encourage you to explore the mindfulness module. On the Counseling Center website, you will also find the mindfulness resources sheet on the Transforming Stress page. In conclusion, we want to remind everyone that at any given time, the present moment tends to be the healthiest place for our minds to exist. Breath work, mindfulness meditations, and grounding techniques all share in present moment experiences. Remember, keep it simple. Practice anytime, anywhere. Be gentle with yourself. 
Remember, you are not your feelings. Talk with a mental health care professional if you have any questions or concerns about whether these techniques are a good fit for you. This slide represents the references used in creation of this presentation and video citations in this presentation are listed in order of appearance at the bottom. We'd like to offer a special acknowledgement and thanks to Rick Benavides for technical enhancement in this presentation and U-Star Studios at LCAC One and Drew Schatz for assisting with the production of this program. Thank you.